people who taught the class, this is how I feel about, in practice, how we think about beta. So I'm going to start today's class with a question about, with questions about betas, cost of debt, cost of capital, all of which you've seen in some form in a previous class. Right? One of the things I'm going to talk about today is what's called a bottom-up beta. Sounds fancy, but you estimate the beta for a company by finding other companies like it. You look up the betas for those companies, and then you average out the betas. Okay, so if I ask you to get a beta for a student, you think, why would I do that? I'll make an argument that that's a much better way to estimate betas than running one regression in a company, taking the slope of the line and running with it. But this is almost a statistical question. If I ask you to estimate the beta for a company, would you rather have a small sample of companies that look, and this is for the beta calculation, so basically, would you rather have a small sample of companies that look just like yours, or a much larger sample of companies that don't look as much like yours, but you get a larger sample? I'll, I'll, I'll set up the example a little more specifically. Today, I'm going to estimate a beta for Embraer. Embraer is a Brazilian aerospace company. If I define comparable as other Latin American aerospace companies, I'm in deep trouble. You know why? There's only one. It's called Embraer. And that's not a service. So basically replacing them. You say, I will make it other aerospace companies that make small corporate jets, because that's what Embraer does. You have two, Bombardier and Embraer, because Lear is more of an executive jet. You have two companies. Or I can define it as aerospace companies, in which case I have Boeing and Airbus and a lot. And if I define it as aerospace and defense companies, I might have a sample of 25. So basically the question is, should I go narrow and just like my company, or broader and get more companies in? Anybody? I'm going to leave the answer because I'm going to come back and address it when I do it. But remember, the the, the, I, when I give you the rationale for bottom-up betas, the answer is going to be obvious because I'm going to base it on a statistical law called the law of large numbers. And what do large law of large numbers require? Large numbers. A sample of three is not a large number, right? So the larger the number, the better. So we'll come back and talk about why it's better to... So if you ask me to be, estimate a beta for an Indian steel company, why am I not just look at other Indian steel companies? I might look at global steel companies. Second, when you think about a comparable firm to use in this analysis, and this is an extension of the first one, do you want a company in the same industry group? Should it have the roughly the same market cap? Now, with each criterion you're adding, what's the good news? You're getting a company that's closer to yours. The bad news is the sample size is shrinking. How many of you have had a chance to activate your capital IQ already? Do it soon, though, because this is an amazing database, because it is all publicly traded companies. You know why it's amazing? Let's suppose you're looking for a steel company. You can go run a screen. It actually lets you pick a screen of all steel companies. You get 2,700. Publicly traded steel companies, you get 800. You say publicly traded steel companies only in North America, you might get 35. You say publicly traded steel companies in North America with a market cap greater than a billion, you might get seven. You actually see the sample size play out as you add criterion. And you also can go take a criterion out if it's causing too much damage to your sample size. You can play with it, see what... So the answer here is, hey, it's nice to add... If I can add all of these criteria and still end up with 100 companies, I'm going to do it. So with software, for instance, where there are 670 publicly traded companies, I can add layer after layer, only entertainment software, and I still have enough companies. So if you have enough of a sample size, you're going to be okay. But that will define how many criteria. So the right answer here is it depends. It depends on how big the sample is and how many criteria I can add without losing the chunk of the sample. We're also going to talk about the cost of debt. The cost of debt, as we said, is the rate at which you can borrow money. But I'm going to add two qualifiers. The rate at which you can borrow money today, long term. You're saying, what's it today got to do? Don't show me the bank loan you had two years ago, five years ago. So I'm going to set up a problem, and I'm going to come back and again fill in the details. Let's suppose a company has a billion dollars in bank loans outstanding. So it's borrowed the money already. It's been on the books. The interest rate on the loan is 4%. It's a remaining maturity of eight years. So the loan you borrowed two years ago, it's still on the books. There's eight more years left. The interest rate is locked in. Right? 
The loans were taken a couple of years ago when rates were much lower, either because interest rates were lower or because you had less default risk. Today, the risk-free rate is 5%. You anticipate that the rate at which you can borrow money today, you're going to have to pay 2% over, the, over that risk-free rate. So I'm going to give you some choices on the cost of debt. It's kind of a precursor to what we're going to talk about today. And you tell me whether this is the number you'd pay. You can say, look, I already have the loans in the book. I'm paying 4%. That's my cost of debt. That's called a book interest rate. And many analysts actually, when they do compute cost of capital, use a book interest rate. The logic being, I've borrowed the money. Why are you, you know, asking me for a cost of debt? That's my cost of debt. The second is to just use the risk-free rate. Why? You just feel uncomfortable using a number lower than the risk-free rate, so you say, I'll use at least 5%. The third is to use the rate at which you can borrow money long term today. I kind of gave away the answer because I kind of set up the question, which is 7%. You see, what the heck is a 5.5%? People feel this urge to average things because it feels better. You know where the 5% 5, 5 came from, right? You have 7, you have 4, you don't want to throw either number away. You put them into a pile, you add them up, you divide by 2. I feel much better now. I'm using all of the information. You know, sometimes the best use for information is to not use it. And one of the things we're going to talk about in valuation is what information you should be ignoring and what information you'll be bringing in. The right answer here is 7%. It's not 4%. It's not 5.5%. We're going to talk about the logic for why, but it's going to make a big difference in your cost of capital. And finally, take that company that I just showed you. It has a billion dollars in bank loans, right? Let's say it has a billion dollars in market cap equity. Remember, for cost of capital, you need weights. So I have a billion in debt, a billion in equity. It looks like this answer is a slam dunk, right? It looks like 50-50. But there must be a reason I put this up here. Is it 50-50? You know what the rule in the cost of capital is? The weight should be market value numbers. For equity, that's already a market value. For debt, though, what do you have? You just have a book value of debt. I know investment banks do this dance. a book value, market value, let's use the book value. But I'm not going to let you play that game because the book value of debt is a billion, but I think I've given you enough information that you can at least tell me what the market value of this debt will be. Tell me in which direction. At least tell me in which direction. Is market value for this company of debt going to be lower than the billion or higher than the billion? You got a 50-50 shot. You took the wrong 50. So it is going to be... Why? What's the interest rate on the loan? 4%. What are current interest rates if they borrow today? 7%. Remember from bond math what happens when interest rates rise above the coupon rate? What happens to the price of a bond? It's going to go down. We're going to talk about estimating the market value of debt even when it's not traded. Let's face it, most companies, most of the debt is not traded. Your bank loans, you have not traded debt. We're going to use this mechanism to convert book debt to market debt. But we have a lot of things on the table now. We have to talk about betas. We have to talk about cost of debt. We have to talk about debt ratios. So let's get this process started. Oh, I forgot to ask the two questions. Who's not in a group yet? Mission accomplished. Who's not picked a company yet? Come on, you be, be honest. I'm not going to pick on you. I just want you to feel a little bad. <laughs> okay. By next week, when I ask this question, I hope there are no hands. Right? So pick a company. So let's uh, go back to where we were in the lecture notes. And we were talking about implied equity risk premiums. I know you didn't get a chance to do it, but on Monday, I sent you this implied equity risk premium spreadsheet that I used to compute the implied premium for the US. Remember, the premium was 5.2%. If you get a chance, because you have a long weekend this weekend right there's no class on monday you have six days to kind of catch up on things and pick a company okay take that spreadsheet and play with it and i mean play with it change the numbers and see what happens it, you're going to see this isn't rocket science it's not some you know complex model i built it's a present value model so when you think about equity risk premiums, I gave you lots of different ways of doing it right you can look at a historical equity risk premium as i, I said i didn't like it but a lot of people use it you can use an implied equity risk premium. You can even perhaps get the equity risk premium by basing it on, remember I showed you that graph of what the default spread on a bond is versus the equity risk premium. 
and roughly speaking over the last 60 years the equity risk has been about two times higher two, two times whatever the default spread is. so if the default spread is two and a half percent based on history maybe the equity risk should be five percent so I have this really 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 long paper on equity risk premiums that I update every year I'm going to send you the link and not expect any of you to read it. it's 120 pages it'll keep you occupied Does anybody have a couple of double A batteries? <laughs> the things I have to do. No, you can keep them. Souvenir, right? <laughs> if you want to sign them for you and you can try to sell them on eBay. <laughs> Batteries dead, demodron or something like that. No? <laughs> so I'll send you the link to this paper. And it's a paper I update every year. It's actually downloaded a lot. It's uh, used by people who do it. So it covers the spectrum on equity risk prints. And towards the end of the paper, after I presented all these different ways of estimating equity risk premiums, I tried to tie up loose sets. In what sense? If you tell people there are 10 ways of estimating something and you leave it there, it is the worst possible thing to do because people say, well, which one of these should I be using? But ultimately, what's our end game here? We want the best estimate for what will happen in the future, right? So we can't lose sight of this. So here's how I end the paper. I take each of the different approaches, historical premiums, implied premiums, the default spread times two, and I look to see which one does the best job of predicting what stocks will actually do over the next 10 years. Ultimately, that's what we're trying to do by computing a correlation. So help me out here. Do you want a high positive correlation, zero correlation, or negative correlation? You want a high positive. You want one, right? Perfect correlation would be great. You're not going to get one. So I tried different approaches. So what are you looking for? You're looking for high positive correlations. So I've given you four choices. You can use the current implied premium, the 5.2%. You could say, look, I want to smooth things out. Maybe you lose an average premium over the last five years. Maybe you'll use a historical premium. Or maybe you'll just take the default spread on bonds and multiply by two. So let's look across the correlation. Which is the worst possible way to estimate equity risk premiums? Historical. historical premium. It's not just low. It's negative. It's perverse. When that historical premium is high, your expected future returns are going to be low. 80% of valuations are based on historical risk premiums, and already you're on quicksand. And in fact, when I compare across the two, it turns out that the best possible estimate for I have for what the premium will be next year, or returns, or over the next 10 years, is just the current implied premium. So I told you when I did the 5.2% at the start of January, for all of January, that's what I used as, an implied, as my equity risk premium in valuing companies which got the bulk of their revenues in the US. Then I got to February and I moved on. Why? Because the risk premium has changed. It was 5.24%. When you get to March, you're going to see a different premium. And the reason I do it is not because I assume the market is right. It's because it turns out historically it's the best predictor of the premium. So if you ask me, why can't I use the five-year average? Do so. In fact, the five-year average is not that bad. It's, you can even use the default, but please don't use the historical premium because if you look at the data, it seems like a, a perverse way of estimating future premiums. Incidentally, to compute the implied premium for the US, I used the index today, I used future cash flows, and backed out an IRR, right? And then to do a country risk premium, I did a little kabuki dash. So I did take the default spread, multiply by 1.18, add it. It seemed like there's a lot of moving pieces. Could I compute an implied equity risk premium for an Indian market or a Brazilian market? Help me out here. When I did my implied premium for the US, what's the information I need? I need the current level of the index, right? Could I get that for the Bovespa? Yes. Sensex? Yes. Any market in the world, that's going to be easy to get. Second, I needed the cash flows last year, right? That's what I got started with. In fact, it's going to be easier outside the US and in the US because outside the US, you don't even have the buyback issue for the most part. It's mostly dividends. I can tell you what they were. What else did I need? I got the cash flows last year and then I applied 
a growth rate for the U.S., which came from looking at what analysts were projecting as growth for the next five years for the S&P 500. And this is where you start to get into trouble with emerging market indices. In most emerging markets, it's very difficult to get five-year growth rates. But if you could get a five-year growth rate, there is absolutely no reason why you could not compute an implied equity risk premium for pretty much any market. So as an example, this is about 10 years ago. I did an equity risk premium for the Sensex, the Indian Equity Index. The level of the index was 15,446. It was actually in, 2000, in September of 2007. 15,446. The dividend yield on the index was about 4%, and Indian stocks were not buying back stocks in 2006, so entire cash flows and dividends. The expected growth rate, I cheated. There was no analyst projecting growth for Sensex stocks, but about half the stocks in the Sensex have ADRs listed in the US, and ADRs are tracked by analysts who project out growth. It's a very dangerous way of estimating growth, because half the stocks I don't have a growth rate, but I take what I can get, and the growth rate for based on those ADRs was about 14% in repeat terms. I'm doing everything in repeat terms. And finally, beyond year five, I'm going to assume the growth rate will continue, but it'll be at the same rate as the risk rate. So I'm doing exactly what I did for the S&P 500. And when I solve for my IRR based on those cash flows, my internal rate of return, my expected return in Indian stocks was about 11.18%. You subtract out the risk-free rate from it, you get an implied equity risk premium for India. There will be a time when I can do this for every country in the world, in which case I don't have to trust ratings to be right, and I don't have to trust default spreads. I'll be getting a direct number. And that will be a much more direct estimate of what are investors in this market charging as a risk premium. And if you're a global portfolio manager, this can become the basis for where you want to invest, right? What's your objective? You want to go with the, the trade-off is best for you. So if I gave you the risk premiums for 100 countries, you can say, look, I'm going to put my money in Mongolia. I'm not suggesting you do that right now. No, because it looks like I'll get a much better risk return trade-off in Mongolia than in China. It is a, a great way to think about global allocation where you're not trusting PE ratios or some expert saying this part of the world is going to do well. It's based on pricing and where you think you can get the most bang for your buck. In fact, I'm going to show you one final a couple of final tapes to illustrate why this process is something that I think is useful. Brazil is one of those markets where I've computed an implied equity risk premium every year. You know the nice thing about having an implied equity risk premium in Brazil? Anybody here from Brazil? Very stable country, right? Nothing really happens year to year. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm just being uh, uh, sarcastic. <laughs> so in case you're a, it is the opposite of stable, right? It gets swings around, strange things happen politically, economically. The problem with the historical premium approach or the ratings approach for Brazil is the ratings agencies are always like two steps behind, two years behind where Brazil is. With an implied premium, I reflect Brazil as it happens. So a lot of Brazilians start washing their cars. Oh, go look up car wash Brazil and then you'll see what I'm doing. Yeah. My implied equity risk premium might have to change because the car wash, Brazilian car wash scandal was a corruption scandal. It brought the entire government on, companies were dragged in. My equity risk premium should be different. So I've been computing implied equity risk premiums. And there's a story here that's actually a very interesting story. I started in 2000. Okay? So the green number is the additional, pre so basically the total number is my implied premium. The red portion is the US premium. So basically that difference is the additional premium. So in 2000, a big chunk of the premium was Brazil related. Then you get to 2001, 2002, Lula gets elected, then people are scared, then progressively they start to get more comfortable. The equity risk premium, by the time you get to 2007, the Brazilian implied a premium was barely higher than the US premium. People were getting really comfortable. The problem with emerging markets is you get really comfortable and the market delivers a surprise and you see a jump in 2008. And again, they start to get really comfortable. 2012, the Brazilian premium was down again. Then, of course, you get you know, the last political scandal. The premium expands again. The advantage of implied premiums is can re I can reflect your market as it exists today, rather than trusting the ratings agencies to get it right. So there's a plus here. And that's why I think my end game at some point in time, I would like to do implied premiums, perhaps not for every country. 165 spreadsheets sounds like a lot. But I can pick 
maybe Brazil and Latin America, I can pick you know, Germany and Europe, Japan and China and perhaps two other Asian. So in a sense, get at least a subset of countries that I can do the premium every month. So we can see how this premium is shifting regionally. And one final table. I, you know, as, as you know, on my website, I collect data on every publicly traded company in the world. There are like 150 countries, and I you know, compute the data, I do averages. So I'm going to draw your attention. Whenever we are to use an average, go look up that. But it, when I do my data analysis, after I've finished all of the company-specific and industry averages, I divide the world into developed and emerging markets. And I'll make a confession. My division is very geography-based, and you can take issue with it, right? So Europe goes into the developed markets. It really? Because let's face it, Italy and Spain and Greece might be more risky than investing in Malaysia and Singapore. But I have to draw a line somewhere because if I sit there saying, I'm going to put this in the develop, I'm going to not, I, I'll hear, I, you know, I won't stop hearing about it for the rest of eternity. People complain, how come you put me in the wrong end? But here's what I do. I divide the entire database into developed and emerging markets. And here's what I do. I compute an implied equity risk premium collectively for developed markets and an implied equity risk premium or implied cost of equity for emerging markets. They're all in dollar terms. Do you see what I'm trying to compute? Across the world, how much of a premium are investors demanding for investing in emerging markets as opposed to developed markets? I'll start with a number that makes sense. In 2004, if you look at, so I want you to focus on these two numbers. Those are my computed numbers. 2004, my implied return on equities in developed markets was 7.28 percent and emerging markets was 10.55 percent. You take the difference between those two numbers, in 2004 people were charging about 3.27 percent more for investing in emerging than developed markets. You say, what's the surprise here? Of course they're going to charge more, it's riskier. Take a look at what happens to that number collectively as you go through time. It keeps drifting down, it's the last decade, you know, people are getting sick. And then you get to 2000, a little blip, but it keeps going down. In fact, by the end of 2012, that number had gone to almost zero. Investors collectively were demanding pretty much the same return on emerging markets as developed markets. And we heard the stories, right? The crisis, basically, there were no developed and emerging markets anymore. It's all shades of gray. We're all emerging markets. We're all developed markets. It's all come together. We're a global economy. And people bought into the story. And then, of course, you had a wake-up call, right? You started to see emerging markets pop up into the trouble sector, something bad, and you see the premiums start to drift back up. But here's the bottom line. If you look at that difference today and compare it to 2004, with all the ups and downs, it is about half what it was in 2004. So I'm going to state this as a reality, that the difference, the divergence between developed and emerging markets is far smaller now than it was 15 or 20 years ago. Why? Because emerging markets have become more developed and developed markets have become more emerging. And I'm not saying that in a kind way, because you know what the old divide was. Developed markets have stable governments and central banks which are not interfered with. You don't have, you know, whimsical governments that come in. And emerging markets are run by unstable governments and central banks. That line has kind of been crossed over and over in both sides, right? So in a sense, we're facing a reality where that line is more of a gray line rather than a black line. And this is a number that I will continue to track. Because A, it'll tell me about this divergence continuing to get lower. It'll also tell me when people are getting will overreach, because I think in 2012 investors overreach, and they will overreach again, and that's a signal that you need to step away from emerging markets until the premium goes back to a number that you think reflects a difference in risk. So now let's talk about betas. In fact, I don't use the word beta, I use relative risk, because in a sense, what's a beta? It's a measure of relative risk. So when I say the beta is 1.2, I'm saying this stock is 1.2 times more risky than the average stock. So I'm going to start off with the way I was taught betas, and I'm sure you were taught betas. I was taught to run a regression. Returns in the stock against returns on the market index. I was told the slope of the line is the beta. What a horrifically bad way to think about betas. Because what have I just done? I made beta into a statistical number. It's a number that comes out of a regression. You say, what are betas a regression number? And that's what will happen if you stop here. But I'm going to make a case for burying regression betas. 
And I'm going to make three arguments why regression betas are so bad. Rather than give them in the abstract, let me start by showing you regressions. You've ever been on a Bloomberg terminal? There are a few around, you know. One of the nice things about a Bloomberg terminal is every time you log on, you increase the likelihood that Michael Bloomberg will be the next president. Because <laughs> Bloomberg is completely, it's a fully, it's a private company. Bloomberg owns 100% of the company. It's worth about 55 to 60 billion. On a bad day, it's probably worth 100 billion plus on a good day. So it raises, it changed, the definition of rich is actually raised to a level you've never seen before. But in a Bloomberg, one of the nice things is you pick a publicly traded company anywhere in the world and you type in the word beta, this page pops up. It's magical. In fact, I go to corporate finance departments and investment banks and I say, where do betas come from? They look, like, look at me like I have two heads. So what do you mean, where do betas come from? They come from Bloomberg. <laughs> because that's where you get betas. But the regression page is what you see. So this is actually a regression beta for GoPro. Remember GoPro? It's this, I, I describe it as a, as a camera for overactive oversharers. Because <laughs> what you do is you strap the GoPro to your head and you go on a five hour hike and you record the whole thing and you put the whole thing on YouTube as if anybody's interested in watching you stagger around for five hours in the middle of nowhere. But for a while it was this rising stock, it went quadrupled in value. So I said, how risky is GoPro? And I ran the regression and it said, hey, there's the beta. I'll come back and talk about the adjusted beta. The raw beta is a regression beta, 1.60. You think this is good, I have a beta. Remember in statistics when you run a regression, what you put in brackets below the regression? You either put a T statistic or you put a standard error. We forget that practice when we come into finance. That's my beta, 1.60. If you keep going down, it says standard error of the beta. Do you see what that is? About 0.50. Let me play a little statistics game with you. The regression beta is 1.60. The standard error in that beta is 0.50. If this were a statistics class and asked you for a range on GoPro's beta, it's plus or minus two standard errors. You're saying it's somewhere between 0.6 and 2.6. <laughs> so thank you for letting me know. <laughs> this regression is almost all noise. The median standard error for a beta estimate in the US is about 0.20. So next time somebody says Coca-Cola's beta is 1.12, plus or minus 0.4. The first, the first problem with betas is they're noisy. Even if you believe regression betas give you the beta, you don't have a beta, you have a range on the beta. You think, what if my regression looks really good? Then be really, really terrified of what this beta is telling you. This is a beta I ran about 20 years ago on a company that used to make phones called Nokia. <laughs> so I run this regression of Nokia. And this is a, look at that regression. If this were a statistics class, I'd get a gold medal. Every point is on the line. The standard error is close to zero. You think, this is great. Let's use this beta. Why is Nokia's beta so much better looking than GoPro's beta? What, what is the beta? When you do a class, it says, take the returns on the stock, run it against a market index, right? And with the class, we kind of deal, leave it as an abstraction. So I went to Bloomberg and said, give me a beta for Nokia. I ran a regression of Nokia against the hex. I'll be quite honest, I thought the hex was a witch's curse. And this turns out to be the Helsinki exchange. You're saying, what the heck is Bloomberg going to Helsinki for? Nokia is a Finnish company. Bloomberg is very, it still does it. You look up the beta for a German stock, on Bloomberg it'll run it against the DAX. A French stock against the CAC, US stock against the S&P 500, Indian stock against the Sensex. You're saying, what's wrong with running it in the Finnish index? I didn't know what was in the hex, so I took a look and I wish I hadn't. It turned out that in 2000, Nokia owned Finland. It was 80%, 80% of the entire index. So what do I have here in my regression? A regression of Nokia against Nokia. An awful lot of the time, the two move together. <laughs> this is mind blowing. I never expected to see this happen. But it's a completely useless bait and here's why. When we measure, when we use beta, we're measuring the risk added to the portfolio of the marginal investor in the company. You're saying, how do I know who the marginal investor in Nokia is? I took a look at the 17 largest stockholders in Nokia, and at the top of the list, 
was Barclays. Barclays at that time. You know what the problem is, if I keep talking, you can hear me, but the people on the recording will not, who cares about them, they're not here anymore. <laughs> oh, you have to, thank you so much. Now, how much of a price can I have? So <laughs> Nobody has a double A in the calculator. <laughs> So you can be the secret depository for whatever gets said in the next three minutes. <laughs> so if you think about the regression bait, it looks good because you're but the biggest single investor in Nokia was Barclays for the global index fund. And if you think about how would Barclays think about the risk in Nokia, they're definitely not looking at the hex to measure risk. They're probably using some global index. <coughs> Here's the bad news. If you want your regression to have a high R squared and look good, you've got to run it against terrible indices. And if you run it against the right index, your base is always going to look crap. There is no way out of this regression. Now part of you think, but why don't we just use the adjusted beta? In fact, I've sat on valuation for equity research and value of companies. So where do you get the beta? I use the Bloomberg adjusted beta. So what is it adjusted for? I don't know, but it's adjusted. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll let you in on a secret as to... It's not her fault, right? I mean, it's just a mix of screw-ups. So what's it adjusted for? Nobody sees. So I'm, I'm going to let, give you the secret, because you can use this to lord it over your Wharton, your, with that Wharton undergrad who's at the same internship as you, and he says, <laughs> you know, I'm using the adjusted beta. Ask him or her the question first, what's it adjusted for? And after he or she looks suitably stupid not knowing the answer, here's the answer. The adjusted beta is always 0.67 times a raw beta plus 0.33 times 1. You say, what? <laughs> so let me give you some numbers. If your raw beta is 1.8, your adjusted beta will become 1.53. Notice for a pattern here. Yeah? 1.5 will become 1.33. 1 1.2 will become 1.13. 0 0.6 will become 0.73. So what's the adjustment doing? It's taking your regression beta and moving it towards one. What's so magical about one? It's the average beta across all companies. They're trying to be helpful. To which your response is, please stop helping. <laughs> because these weights must be magical weights. They work on 40,000 companies, right? Every company, 0 0.67, 0 0.33. So I decided to call Bloomberg, not the mayor, but the company. <laughs> this was about 15 years ago. And I said, no. Uh, and I said, I'd like to talk to somebody about your beta page. They put me in touch with the beta calculation guy at Bloomberg. There is a guy at Bloomberg whose life it is to maintain this page. 
Can you imagine how exciting his life must be? He goes to a cocktail party and says, I'm the beta guy from Bloomberg. Dozens of people gather around for stories. Not. He's pathetically grateful to get a call from the outside world. I don't know what they do to the guy. Maybe they keep him locked up in a basement room, feed him through a hole in the wall. You know, he said, I'm so glad you called. I have all day to answer your questions. I didn't have all day to ask him questions, but I was afraid if I hung up the phone too soon, he might do something rash. So after what I thought was a polite period of conversation, five, six minutes of kind of shooting the breeze, I finally hit him the question. Why 0.67 and 0.33? He said, oh, two minutes of silence. I can hear papers being rustled, terminals being turned off and on. And finally comes back and says, I don't know it was here when I got here. I said, what? He said, I was hired three years ago. It was here when I got here, don't blame me. I said, I'm not blaming you, I just want to know where the numbers came from. No, here when I got here. I have 12 books out. I have the title for my 13th book picked out. You know what it's going to be called? Here when I got here. Because <laughs> you know how often you're going to hear this answer when you go to work and you say, why do we use this number over and over again? I don't know, it was here when I got here. Yeah. When did you get here? 1979. <laughs> it's amazing how much evaluation we outsource. You sit and say, you know, I'm a person presenting evaluation, I got the cash flows from management, okay? I got the beta from Bloomberg, okay? I got the equity risk premium from Duff and Phelps, okay? I got the risk free rate from the government treasury, so what exactly are you doing? You're a concierge of some sort. You collect all this data. You put it into a spreadsheet. Too much evaluation has become here when I got here, the answer. So after I asked this question, it must have created some internal tension. So you know what Bloomberg did? Notice that the adjusted beta calculation has completely disappeared from the output. It's still 0.67 times the raw beta plus 0.33 times 1 but it's no longer open and out there. So I guess nobody's asking them questions, they're just using the adjusted beta. So here's the bottom line. If you have to use a regression beta, I don't like what you do, at least use the regression beta. Because all the adjusted beta is telling you is which direction one is. And if you're sitting there, I wonder which direction one is, I'm at 1.8. You should not be doing valuation in the first place. If you want to get from 1.8 to one, do you know how to get there? Go 1.8, 1.6, 1.4, 1.2, 1, you're there. You don't want somebody who wants, let me give you a number closer to 1 in case you're really confused. Let's keep building, let's dig this grave for regression betas. We've already got it half, you know, half dug, let's continue digging. Third problem with regression betas is it's one slice of history. You know what I mean by one slice of history? You sit down to run a regression, you take a period of time, right? You think, so what? If something unusual happened to your company during those two years, strange things will happen to your betas. Good or bad things, either way. This is actually a regression beta for a company called Value. So I ran this regression over a period where the stock price collapsed. It dropped by 80%. Right? It's terrible stock, hugely risky stock, right? But the beta for the stock was 0.36. How do you explain that? What does beta measure? It measures how you move with the market. Do you see what's happening here? This is an accounting scandal, it's blowing up, the company's collapsing, every day you open up the paper, what do you see? The stock is down, the stock is down, the stock is down. Whether the market goes up or down, guess what's gonna to happen to your beta? There is zero chance, in fact I did this when I was valuing value, there is zero chance I'm sitting down to value value and saying, hey, you know what, I'm gonna use a 0.36 regression beta. Because one slice of history, all kinds of weird stuff can happen. And finally, it's easy to play games with regression betas. One of the nice things, if you can call it nice in a, with a Bloomberg beta, is you can sit there and change things. Like what? You can change the index, you can change the starting point, you can change the ending point, you can go weekly, monthly, daily. I've told people, you give me a Bloomberg terminal in about 25 minutes, you tell me what beta you want for your company, I will deliver a printed page to back you up. But I might have to try 50 iterations before I get there, but I can get there. If you don't think analysts play games with those Bloomberg betas, you operate in a universe very different from mine. 
So when somebody shows me an adjusted page, this is the adjusted page, you know what my question is? How many times did you try before you printed this page? Maybe you tried seven different indices, weekly and monthly, different starting and ending points. There's no way I'm building a valuation of one slice of history where all kind of game playing kicks in. In fact, this is Bombardier, the other part of Embraer, the Canadian small air. No, and the beta is very different depending on whether I'm against the Canadian index or the US index, whether I try weekly or monthly, different periods. So I'm going to give you a way of estimating betas. We are not dependent on one slice of history and one regression. But before I do that, I'm going to deal frontally with something that people have an issue with, with betas in general. In about four, three months, I've been invited to Omaha to present to the portfolio managers there at the Berkshire. Hathaway get together. I'm not going to the meeting themselves, but I'm going to present to the managers. They all claim to be value investors. So you think that they must be estimating discount rates and doing DCFs. I will wait that the 95% of the people in the room don't do discounted cash flow valuation. So you think, how can they be value investors? They buy low PE stocks or low price to book stocks. And we ask them, why don't you do discounted cash flow valuations? You know what the universal answer is, or pretty much the universal answer? Because we don't like betas. It's actually fed down. Warren Buffett has been open about the fact that he doesn't like betas. He doesn't use betas. Charlie Munger says some terrible things about betas. And it, these are, of course, you know, like the, 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 the cult. It's essentially the equivalent of a cult. If they say it, it must be true. And they say, OK, you don't like betas. I don't like betas either. Tell me why you don't like betas. He said, what do you mean? Why? There are two reasons you might fundamentally disagree with the use of betas. The first is, what did I use to estimate betas? I ran a regression based on prices, right? What's the essence of intrinsic valuation? We don't trust the market. So the first argument is, you're using a price-based measure of risk when we're intrinsic value people. Fair enough. The other argument against betas is when you use a beta to come up with the risk for a company, what are you assuming about the marginal investor? Diversified, therefore the risk they care about is the risk. So maybe the other reason you don't like betas is because you don't believe investors are diversified. In fact, one of the other things old-time value investors do is they believe in concentrated portfolios. You know what I mean by concentrated? They think this spreading and buying 25, 30 stocks is an admission of weakness, that if you truly believe in your investments, you should be okay with five. So maybe. So here's what I do. I say, okay, you don't like it because it's price-based. Let me give you some alternatives. I could estimate the equivalent of a beta using accounting earnings. Now I've left prior, and you've told me intrinsic value is based on earnings. I could compute what looks like a beta based on accounting earnings. It looks like a regression, but I use changes in earnings instead of changes in stock prices. I could even look at your cost of debt and scale it up. So if your cost of debt is 5%, I can observe it. I can say, look, you know, typically the cost of equity is twice the cost of debt, or 1.8 based across all companies. So I can give you a way of estimating cost of equity that doesn't depend on past prices. Or if you tell me that you don't believe in diversified investors, if you don't believe in, uh, in diversification, now I can focus this on just the company you're analyzing so you don't have to worry about the regret. If you don't like it because you like price-based measures, I can give you alternatives based on numbers. So I'm going to, here's what I'm going to do. What I need is a measure of relative risk, right? You don't like betas. Give me a different, what, tell me what you focus on in risk. Maybe it's earnings variability. Maybe it's how big the company is. Maybe it's how many customers you have. You remember that matters if you have three customers, you worry about losing a customer. Tell me what your proxy for risk is and I'll create a measure that looks just like a beta around it. And once I do it, I'm off to the races because to me, this is just a stop on a very long journey. This is not where I want to fight my battles. So when people say, I don't like betas, and that's why I don't do it, I don't get it. You don't like betas, tell me what to use instead. I will build something that looks exactly like it. Ultimately, what I want is a risk-adjusted discount rate. I'm completely agnostic about how I measure risk. And if you have a strong view on risk, I'll replace betas. For me, betas are convenient. I'm OK with them. But if you feel strongly against them, I have a way of around it. So if you look at alternatives, to price -based me uh, if, you, if you want to stay with price-based measures, but you want to give up on the diversification argument, here are your choices. One is use the standard deviation of the stock price. When you use betas, you look at the covariance, how it moves to the market. You say, well, that's you know, all academic. I care about how much my stock moves. Tesla looks very risky because it moves a lot. 
then I'll just focus on your total standard deviation rather than try to, so I can compute a ratio. So let's say your stock has a standard deviation of 50%. The median stock in the US market has a standard deviation of about, about 30%. Do you see where I'm gonna go? Your standard deviation is 50, the average is 30, 50 divided by 30 is one point, that looks a lot like a beta, doesn't it? But it's based on standard deviation, I'm not running a regression. The second is what I call proxy models. What do you do? You, here you really trust history. You look back over time, over the last 50 years, you look to see what small companies have earned. And so think of it as historical risk premiums on steroids. Because you're not just computing for the market, you're computing it for subsets. And you're using that number. In and if you do that, remember the standard error that comes with it. And third, there are people who use what I call cap M plus. And here's how it'll work. You'll take the risk-free rate plus beta times risk premium. That's where we stopped, right? But in these approaches, you add a small cap premium. And uh, so basically, you take that number and you add things to it. And when do you stop? When you think you have a number that was the number you were looking for in the first place. You know, uh, appraisers call this the build-up approach. I said the make-up approach. Basically, you get the, so you're going to get to 23% come you know, hook or crook. So essentially, you don't like betas. I'll give you alternatives, but don't expect any of them to be perfect. If you don't like price-based measures, that's your problem. It's not diversification that's even an issue. Then you're trusting accountants. And you know what I think about accountants. But maybe you trust them more. You think accounting earnings are less flawed than stock prices? Okay, you live in a different universe than I am. And I will compute you know, how risky... We know accountants actually admit up front that they smooth out earnings, right? That's the job of accountants is take big expenses and spread them out. So you can take accounting earnings based measures. And if none of this appealed to you, and you would say, look, I want to divide my market up into five groups, very risky, risky. So basically give them enough. Five. And you take 8% and make it your middle group and then 10. I'm okay with that as well. In fact, I, I would show you histograms for the cost of capital. And sometimes when I'm valuing a risky company, I go to the 90th percentile and I move on because this is not where I want to spend my time. And finally, as I said, you can take the cost of debt because that I can observe. What does a bank charge? And build up from that arguing that if the bank is charging you 10%, then the cost of equity has to be higher than that. So you can think about alternatives. So my ad advice to you is don't get stuck on this beta thing. And if you run into somebody at work, it's usually going to be a boss who says, this is very academic. I don't, you know, I don't like betas. Don't do a DCF. I know you shouldn't take a stand as an intern, say, but that's not a good reason for abandoning cash flows and risk. There is a different way of thinking about risk. So when I started with betas, I showed you the conventional. Let's run a regression. And most people who use betas, you ask them where the beta comes from. Once they get past it, comes from Bloomberg. It's usually it comes from a regression. But that is really not true. You know where betas come from? They come from choices you make as a company. Like what? You tell me what you do as a company, what kind of products and services you provide, I can start guessing what kind of beta you'll have. And here's why. Betas measure how you move with the market. So I'm going to make a statement, and I'll, I'll back it up, but you can start thinking in common sense terms why this is going to be true. The more discretionary the product or service you provide as a company, the higher your beta will be as a company. You know what I mean by discretionary? If you provide a product or service that people can live without, that they can delay buying, they can defer buying, your beta will be much higher than if you produce a product or service where people have to buy. In fact, let me take retailing, which is considered one business, and divide it up into, into multiple layers. You have luxury retailing. Then you have department stores, and you have discount retailing, and then you have grocery stores. Given what I just said, which of these four groups should have the lowest beta? Which one? Groceries, why? Because you could delay buying that Tiffany's brooch you think you cannot live without. Trust me, you can. You know? People have done it before. <laughs> but it's kind of tough to live without food. But let's take the grocery store business. It's a big business. Within the grocery store business, you've got you know, Safeway and you've got Whole Foods. Which one do you think should have the higher beta? What does Whole Foods do? 
and you know, take eggplant and they triple the price and you're saying, do you want to be organic? And when you're doing well and you, know, you feel flush with cash, you say, you know what, I feel organic. <laughs> But when you lose your job, guess what? You will eat the inorganic eggplant and say, look, I'm going to die anyway. What difference does it make? <laughs> but even within businesses, you can see why betas are going to be different. Discretionary, non-discretionary. So when you sit down to value a company, before you get caught up in that Bloomberg beta, start and think about what do they do? What do they sell? Because that's going to give you some insight about whether it's going to have a high beta or a low beta. Second stop. Tell me something about your cost structure. The greater the proportion of your costs that are fixed costs, the higher your beta will be as a company. And think of what? When you have lots of fixed costs, and your revenues go up, you're going to make lots of money. When they go down, you're going to lose lots of money. Essentially, it takes mood swings and makes, them, makes you into a bipolar. Basically, it pushes the swings out to extremes. Because what fixed costs do is they have to be paid in good times and bad times. It makes you business. So if you're in a business with a lot of fixed costs, you will have a higher beta than if you don't. Airlines, notorious for cost structures, right? Think about the cost structure for an airline. Biggest single cost is leasing the aircraft. Fixed cost or variable cost? You can't go to the, you know, you know what, our planes are only really half full, could be half the lease. Doesn't work that way. Fixed cost. On top of that is fuel cost. Fixed cost or variable cost? You better hope it's fixed. I'm, I'm on the flight this evening back to San Diego. Can you imagine the pilot coming out and counting the people on the plane? Only 25 people yelling out of the window. We're only halfway full. Fill it up halfway. Let's see how far we get. I'm off that plane right away. Right? If you can cancel flights, it might become variable. And if you take spirit, you can see they take this to that nth degree. Right? Only 25 people. Let's cancel the flight. We'll give them a reason after the fact. But if you're a traditional airline and you have a route that you're flying, Fuel cost becomes fixed cost. Employee expenses. There are four stewardesses on the plane. There are only three people on the plane. They don't lay off to saying, you know, just, you're fired. You might be outnumbered by the stewardesses on a flight. Trust me, the service doesn't get any better with, you know, whether you're outnumbered or not. Fixed cost, fix, fix, fix. So guess what? Do you notice that, have you noticed that airlines never have a normal year? They're either making billions or going bankrupt. <laughs> There's no middle ground. It's not, oh, it's just a regular year. There is no regular year in your airline because that's what fixed costs do. But to show you even within the airline business, there can be an outlier. Who's the outlier in the airline business, the most written about company in case history? I wish so, Spirit, but it's Southwest, right? More cases have been written about Southwest. So what does Southwest do first? It leases aircraft just like everybody else. But for a long time, it leased only one type of aircraft. Every Southwest flight was a Boeing 737. You know why? Because it allowed them to keep the maintenance cost low, have one crew. It allowed them to keep the number of spare parts. Because every plane was a 737. They did it because they wanted to keep it. Fuel costs, I hope they don't economize because I sometimes fly Southwest. But they're one of, the two, one of two airlines in the world that hedges consistently. The other is Singapore Air. You know what I mean? Hedges consistently, they hedge all the time because they want to know what the cost is going to be so they can set the fare because Southwest doesn't play fair games. Right? You, don't get, you get that one day discount sometimes, but basically. You see, what do the rest of the airlines do? They hedge selectively. They, you know when they start hedging? When oil prices have peaked. So this, in fact, one way to play the oil game is to look what airlines are doing, do the exact opposite. Okay. Yeah, which means it's a fixed cost, but it's a, it's, a, it's a cost that gets built into the prices. And employees, it's surprise me, Southwest is a unionized airline, but it's got the most flexible workforce in the, of, of any of the airlines. It's the only airline where a stewardess has checked me into a flight. Has that ever happened to you at United? You could be surrounded by stewards, they're all checking the job description, saying, no, 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 I've never checked a person on, that's somebody else's job. I actually had one Southwest flight where the entertainment system failed, and the stewardess told us jokes for the rest of the flight. This is well beyond the call of duty. She was actually a pretty good comedian. Maybe she has her own Netflix show now. <laughs> Everybody has a show on Netflix, you know, what's one more person? Right? So holding all that's constant, 
And finally, there is one final feature of the Southwest model that every discount airline in the world has imitated, right? I remember for the first time I flew Southwest was about eight years ago. I had to fly from New York to LA. So I made the reservation. I didn't even check the flight. The flight date comes around. And I say, well, which airline? Is it JFK? Is it Newark? Or is it LaGuardia? This is how unprepared I was. And it said, I slip. I said, what? Where the heck is I slip? <laughs> it's a star. If, I, if you're from I slip, don't take this personally. But I have no idea where I slip was. So I checked it on the map. And I get in. I finally get to I slip. I get on the plane. We fly across. We land. I come out, and there's this huge statue of John Wayne in the airport. I said, this isn't LAX. <laughs> we landed on, you're saying, what the heck were they doing? For the longest time, Southwest would fly out of one no-name airport to another no-name airport. you think, why would they do that? Why wouldn't they fly out of something like Newark or JFK? Have you ever flown United out of Newark, Terminal C? This is what hell looks a little bit like, right? <laughs> iPads everywhere. If you have cash, you won't eat tonight. I have to go through. You know, if you have cash, you have, you're going to have a tough time. There are no people there. Right? But they have like 120 gates in there. I think they do things for laughs sometimes. They fly you into gate three, give you a connecting flight on 118, and they watch you run. There's somebody upstairs watching and coming. <laughs> Look, here, let's switch signs on them, right? And how does United have these gates? They pay Newark Airport a fixed fee for every gate. Where the flights go in or not. So when times are good, it's not a problem. When times are bad, guess what? That's a huge fixed cost. And you can say the same thing about Heathrow or Frankfurt or any of the big airports. So you know, when Southwest in its early days said, no, we're not paying that. We'll fly out of Islip. Islip paid Southwest to fly out of Islip. So you're putting us on the map. You know, We'll pay you if you come to this airport. Yeah. They're imitated all over the world, right? I remember taking a discount airline in Europe. Don't ever do it. I landed in Paris, and I come out and said, this is in Paris. <laughs> it's like 100 miles out. I went to the gate, so how do you get to Paris? And they said, just keep walking. It's about 103 miles that way. <laughs> but this is exactly, the, the idea here is you want to keep the cost structure low. You're going to fly out of no-name airports. And as a consequence, when I value Southwest, I might give them a lower beta than the rest of the airlines because they have less fixed costs. There's one final dimension. When you borrow money, you just increase the beta for your equity. And here's why. When you borrow money, you create a fixed cost you did not have until you borrowed the money, right? What am I talking about? Interest expenses. You've got to make interest expenses in good times, but unfortunately, they make you make interest expenses in bad times as well, those unpleasant bankers. What does it do? It makes good times better and bad times worse because it just exaggerates. So if you're an equity investor and you borrow, and there I can actually link the beta up to how much you borrow. I'm going to create what's called an unlevered beta. You're saying, what the heck is an unlevered beta? That beta comes from the business you picked and your cost structure. So you're an airline, you're a retail, your unlevered beta would reflect it. Then I'm going to ask you how much debt you have, and I'm going to compute a debt to equity ratio. Sounds fancy, but for every dollar of equity, in market value terms, how much have you borrowed? And the more you borrow, the higher that ratio will become. And as that ratio goes up, the beta that will observe for your equity will also go up with it. You can take a really safe company and end up with a really risky equity in that company if, I, if you borrow enough money. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to use this as, kind of an, as a way of getting around regression betas. When you ask me to estimate the beta for a company, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to estimate the beta of the business you're in, airlines, retail. And I'll talk about how I get that. Then I'm going to adjust if I can. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk about why this adjustment can be difficult to do unless you have outlier companies for operating levels. That's what the fixed cost to variable cost is. And finally, I'm going to adjust for your debt. And that adjustment is going to be pretty simple because debt and the market value of equity should be observable. So first step in this process is getting a business beta and then adjusting for operating leverage. What's operating leverage? Fixed cost and variable cost, right? I almost never adjust for operating leverage when I do my betas. And here's why. To adjust for operating leverage, I need to know how much of your costs are fixed, how much are variable. I challenge you to take any income statement 
and back out from it what's fixed, what's variable. Accountants don't break cost into fixed, they have cost of goods sold. You can try to guess and say, maybe cost of goods sold is variable and SGNA is fixed, but you're guessing. The problem with adjusting for operating leverage is not because we don't know how to do it, but the information for that adjustment is very difficult to get. Because if I did have that, I would actually go to the beta for an airline business, take each airline, say what's the fixed cost, what's the variable cost, and adjust over time. So if you ask me to estimate the beta for a steel company, rather than start the beta of the steel business and adjust for fixed cost, I'm going to assume that most steel companies have pretty much the same fixed cost structure. I'm going to start with the beta being in the steel company adjustment. And then I'm going to adjust for debt. And the adjustment I use is called a Hamada beta. You're saying, who the heck is Hamada and why is his name attached to it? Because about 40 years ago, Hamada was teaching at the University of Chicago, came up with this equation. It sounds, you know, it looks complex, but what he did was, he said, look, the business risk of a company is the business risk. So let's say there are 100 units of risk in a company based on the business it's in. Let's say you have 100 shares and no debt. So every share is going to bear one unit of risk, right, everybody. Let's suppose I take this company, borrow $50 and retire 50 shares because I don't need that many shares. The business risk is still 100 units, right? The lender said, no, no, we're not bearing that risk. We're lenders. We want to be paid a fixed amount. Guess what the remaining 50 shareholders now have to do? They have to bear more of the risk. That's all this is, like an algebra problem. I'm loading up the, the risk on my equity investors. Implicit in this calculation is the assumption that debt holders bear no market risk. They can have default risk, but they bear no market risk. And that's not a bad assumption if you're triple B, single A, double A, triple A rated. But if you become a junk bond company, if you ever look at a junk bond, you know what causes junk bonds to move on a day-to-day -day basis? It's not what happens to interest rates, it's whatever happens to equity affects the junk bond because you're buying a slice of the company where you're really uncertain about whether you're going to be, it starts to behave like equity. And there the argument can be made that assuming the bait of debt is zero is a little over the top. And if you really, really are a purist, I'll give you a way of adjusting for it, but then you have to be willing to estimate a beta for your debt as well. So I use the Hamada, I, I'm going to tell you from this point on, you're going to see me use the first calculation all the time. And if you use this and somebody pushes back and says, why are you assuming the beta of debt is zero? Act compliant, you say, you're right, I missed it. Can you give me the beta of debt? And they very quickly will back off and say, okay, okay, keep doing what you're doing. Because getting a bait of debt is not easy, right? You can't look it up on Bloomberg. You have to run your own regressions. I actually have a way of doing it if you wanted to do it. So if you go and re read my corporate finance notes, I give you, it's really not worth the effort to be quite honest. So here's the way I'm gonna estimate betas. I don't like regression betas. You have a company, you want me to estimate your beta. I'm gonna start with a question. Tell me what business or businesses you're in. So let's play along. You start a company. Let's say you started a company on the side. Have you? No? Okay. Pick any two businesses you want. Just whatever. Retail and vaping. How about that? Okay. So she's in the retail business and the vaping business. No, I don't, do you want vaping? I'll take it off. You know, you, you're okay with it. <laughs> So here's what I'm going to do. I'll be back tomorrow. I go find as many publicly traded retail companies as I can. Will I have any trouble? No, there are hundreds and hundreds of them. They're publicly traded, so what can I look up on each one? I can look up the beta for each one. So I, let's say I have 100 retail companies. I look up the regression betas for each of the 100. I take an average, simple average. I now have a beta for a retail company. But those retail companies have leases and debt, and I want to know the beta for being in the retail business. You see the line I'm drawing between beta for a retail company and being in the retail business? Because, because these retail, so basically I'm gonna say, look, I know you have debt, so I'm gonna clean up this beta for debt. It's called unlevering a beta. Again, it's algebra, I'm just moving that equation around, end up with an unlevered beta of being in the retail business. Then I turn to the vaping business. I've dug a hole for myself by picking the vaping business. Because when I look for publicly traded vaping companies, I won't find very many. So you know what I do? I look at tobacco companies. Why? Because it's only a matter of time before vape, vaping companies face exactly the same problem that tobacco companies do in a different form. You think that's stretching. 
Maybe, maybe if you want to give me a different group, I'm going to find publicly traded tobacco companies, I'm going to the beta, I'm going to do exactly, so when I'm done, I'm going to have an unlevered beta for retail and an unlevered beta for inhaling smoke. <laughs> and then I'm going to come back and say, you told me you're in two businesses, tell me how much value you get from each business. The reaction is, I don't know how much value I get, but I get 70% of my revenues from retail and 30% from vaping. It's okay. You know what I'm going to do next, right? I have the unlevered betas of the two businesses. I take a weighted average, weighted by 70 and 30 percent. I now have an unlevered beta for your company. And a one final question I'm going to ask you. What's that question? Do you have any debt? And if you say no, I'm done. Because that unlevered beta will now become your beta for equity. But if you do have debt, what, what do I have to do next? I have to compute a debt to equity ratio. I plug it and I end up with a levered beta for your company. Now, why am I doing all of this? Because I don't trust regression betas, right? Where did I get the 100 retail company betas? I got them from regressions. All I've done is replace one regression beta with an average of 100. So what's the big savings? This is where the law of large numbers kicks in. You take 100 crappy betas, you average them out. The average is magically precise. I'll be quite honest, in my statistics class, I didn't get that. You take 100 crappy numbers and average them. How the heck does the average get precise? And the answer is actually pretty intuitive. When I say the standard error on a regression beta is high, what am I saying? Some of my beta is overestimated. Some are underestimated, right? When I average out, I average out my mistakes. You know what the standard error of an average of 100 betas is going to be? So let's say the standard error on a typical company's beta I said was 0.2, right? If I have 100 companies, each of which has a regression beta of 0.2, and I average those 100 betas out, my standard error is not going to be 0.2. It's going to be 0.02. You know why 0.02? It's 0.2 divided by the square root of 100. That's how. So bigger the sample, the more savings I get in standard error. The second is the bottom of beta can be adjusted to reflect the debt to equity ratio you have today. Whereas when I run a regression beta, you might have had a no debt five years ago, a lot of debt today. I get to figure, to incorporate your debt to equity ratio. And if you plan to change it in the future, I can be proactive. In fact, if you want to be in a new business next year, I can bring that in, right? You say, I want to be in the steel business. And finally, last week I valued Casper. I went to Bloomberg and looked for an adjusted beta for Casper. It wasn't there. Why? It's still private. Until it goes public, there are no prices. So if the only way you can get betas is from a regression, you're kind of stuck, right? You can't value Uber, Uber before it goes public. And you definitely can't value Airbnb yet. I can do that now, right? You know what I'm going to use as my business for Airbnb? I'm going to use a hotel business. It's a very different business model in the numerator, but it's coming. And I can do it. I don't have to wait for two years after it gets well. What do I do for two years? Wait until I get the data, and then I'll invest in companies? So let me take you through a very simple example of how this would work out. Vale is a Brazilian mining company. So I wanted to get a beta for Vale. So here's what I did. I went to their annual report, and they broke themselves down into four businesses. The first is metals and mining. The second is, and, and my suggestion is when you want to break a company down, start with what they break. I'm not saying you have to stay stuck with that. You open up Disney's annual report. They have theme parks, they have broadcasting. So look at their breakdown. And they gave me the, so basically for each of these groups, here's what I did. I went looking for companies that I would call comparable. For metals and mining and iron ore, it was, no, it was easy for me. You're a mining company. You're not a Brazilian. You're part of a global mining. I mean, you all compete against BHP and uh, you know, Rio. It's, it's basically, you're not going to. So I looked at global companies. And the nice thing about global companies is I get pretty big samples. Fertilizers, I looked at specialty chemical companies globally, 693 companies. And for logistics, I looked at global transportation companies. I get big, large samples. I get non levered beta going through the process I just described. And then... To weight them, here's what I do. I start with revenues, which is what Vale breaks their businesses down. If I'm in a hurry, I could use revenue weights. But here's the problem with revenue weights. You're assuming that a dollar in revenue in logistics is worth the same as a dollar in revenue in mining. And we know that's not true. Why? Because margins vary. I mean, take Apple, right? 
you could have the iPhone business, you can have the computer business, you can have the services business, you can now have the media part of the business, the entertainment. A dollar in revenues in the iPhone business is worth a lot more than a dollar in revenues in their computer business. Why? Because the margins they have in the iPhone business are three times higher. Now, rather than try to do a full-fledged valuation, I cheated. And here's what I did. Remember the companies I used to get the betas? I also, for each of these companies, looked up a ratio of enterprise value. What's enterprise value? It's market value. So basically, this is what the market is valuing these companies at as a multiple of revenue. So if you look at metals and mining, a dollar in revenues in a metal and mining business translates into a dollar ninety-seven value. For iron ore, it's two and a half. So basically what I've done is I've taken the revenues of each business, I'm multiplying by this number to come up with my estimated value. My weights are based upon that estimated value. And based on what I see in this company, it's about 76% my iron ore, about 17% metals and mining, about 5% fertilizers, and about 2% logistics. The one rule you can absolutely not violate when you do this is make sure your weights add up to 100%. Otherwise, bad things are going to happen to your betas. So whatever weighting system you use, make sure the weights add up to 100%. And my unlevered beta for Vale as a company is 0.84. It's a weighted average of these betas. That's an unlevered beta. To get a levered beta, I need a debt to equity. For Vale as a company, it was easy. I could see the total debt. I could see the market equity. The debt to equity ratio is 55%. I used that to come up with a levered beta. And the case of Vale, because they're a mining company, I chose to do my analysis in US dollars. Notice how I picked those words deliberately, because you're saying it's a Brazilian company. How come you don't do it in RIAs? They actually report their financials in US dollars. Commodity companies and mining companies, no matter where they are in the world, often report their numbers in dollars. It's easier for me to do things in dollars. And in a way, that makes my life easier, right? I use the T-bond rate as my risk free rate. The equity risk premium is a weighted average of where Vale operates. And guess what Vale's biggest market is? Remember the clue I, when we did that? What did I say? When you're in doubt on a question, what should you say? China. You got it. Bali's biggest market is China. The one thing that you're saying, why do, in my corporate finance class, I also compute costs of equity and capital by business. Why? Because when I take projects in the mining business, as opposed to, I should be using different discount rates. And one of the challenges when you get to the divisional or the business level is getting debt to equity ratios, because divisions don't often carry debt. In the case of Bali, I ch chose the same debt to equity ratio for all four businesses. But when I do Disney, I don't want to do that because I know that theme park business carries a lot more debt than their movie business. So there I tried to allocate the debt, but the end game here is I want a levered bait and a cost of equity that reflects it. I know you're getting to the end of the tether, but let me finish up before you get a six day break. I talked about no, Embraer. Embraer is an aerospace company. And I use global aerospace as my sector segment. And the reason I use global aerospace is if, if I use Latin American aerospace, I'm stuck in a smaller. So I need, I need sample size. So here I can't afford to have any criteria added in. I use the unlevered beta for those companies, a 0.95. And when I did this in Brazil, the first question I was asked was, but this is a Brazilian company. Shouldn't my beta be higher? What's the answer to that? Why not? I do need to bring country risk somewhere into this process, right? But where do I bring country risk in my calculations? It's, it's not in the risk free rate, it's not in the beta, it's in the risk premium. So I'm going to say, look, you know, I'm not going to keep pushing up every input because you tell me you're in a risky market. Your risk premium, ref in fact, every number in your calculation has a weight to bear, right? Your risk free rate reflects the currency you're doing your valuation in. Your beta reflects the businesses you're in. Your equity risk premium reflects where you do business. Don't let them swim together. All kinds of weird stuff will happen. You double count and triple count. So when I did my levered beta, I used the unlevered beta for global aerospace. And I said aerospace is aerospace. I used the debt to equity ratio and tax rate for Embraer. That, there I have to look at the company. And the levered beta I ended up with is 1.07. If you go to my website, you would see I compute betas by business. And I break my beta calculation to six groups. I do it for US companies. I do it for European companies, I do it for emerging market companies, Australia and Canada, because I don't know where to put them. You know, kind of oddman. 
and I do a global breakdown. And people often email me saying, you got a global beta for the sector, you also have an emerging market, which one should I use? How do you answer the question? You help me out. Which one should you use? In the case of a company like Embraer, I'm going to say use the global. But if you're a telecom company, I might ask you to use just the emerging market companies. Why is that? What did, what's the first, yeah. It's revenues, but go back to what would you say the three variables that drive made is how discretionary is your product, right? In the US and Europe, telecom services are kind of non-discretionary. You will stop eating before you turn off your Verizon, I would think, right? I don't know whether. I would